And good morning, Exchange family. How are you guys doing this morning? Good, good. I like to hear that. I heard online too, even though you're not in the room and I hear you. I'm glad to be here with you today. And I'm so excited about closing out this series called Light in the Dark today. It's been such a good series that we've walked through for the past three weeks. Uh, and I'm excited about what God's got for us today. But first, man, I would be amiss if I didn't say something about our awesome worship team. Man, it was amazing to get to sit in the back today and to worship alongside you and to lift up Jesus' name. They do such an awesome job of ushering us into the presence of God and getting our hearts ready for worship. So, man, I just want to say thank you to them uh, for helping us get to where we are today. I mean, one thing um, that I think that we need to do is that we need to go back and we need to talk about where we've been throughout this series in order to know where we're going. Because some of you may have not been here, you may have not been able to catch up with us on the podcast yet, um, but so I want to just do something quickly to give us a recap of where we've been. And so in week one, Pastor Tyler, he talked about how Jesus is the word of life, and that everything is held together by him, everything's created for him, and everything we do should be for him. And then last week in week two, then Pastor Bryant came up and he talked about how God is light and in him we have fellowship and forgiveness through him and with each other. And today, as we turn to 1 John chapter 1, you can go ahead and turn there if you want to uh, get ready. We're going to look at chapter uh, 1 verses 8 through 10 and we're going to talk about a specific problem that I think we have that these verses talk about and give us a remedy to. And so today, that problem that I want us to look at is the problem that we all share on some level or another. I think we all share the problem that we don't want others to know who we really are inside. We don't want others to know any of the, of the sin that goes on in our heart, the deceitfulness, the envy, the jealousy. We don't want people to know what really goes on inside of us. And we try to paint a picture for other people to see because we don't want them to know the real us. You see, I think if we look around our culture, it's really easy to see. I mean, millions of Americans are in debt up to their eyeballs right now because as soon as they get a job out of college, they go buy a house that's way out of their budget because they're trying to paint a picture for others to see of what they want them to look like. And it doesn't stop there because they go and they buy this big new house that they can't afford and they're already struggling. But then you can't drive a busted ride to go up in your driveway in this big, nice house. You've got to buy something nice. You can't stop there. you got to get a nice vehicle because if you don't, then people will know outside that you're not what you're claiming to be. I think probably the worst age range for uh, painting a picture for somebody is the teenage years. I know for me anyway, when I was a teenager, man, I cared about what I wore. I cared about what I drove. I cared about the friends that I hung out. And I cared about who was looking at me because I wanted to impress Uh, some of the ladies on the other side of the room, I wanted them to think, hey, I like that guy and I want to hang out with him. See, we, we paint a picture for others to see. And I think probably the number one place where we do that is on social media. I think so many times, man, we go on there and we try to paint a picture of how awesome our life is. Now, don't get me wrong. I think there are some people that go on and they talk about how awful life is. But for the most part, We don't do that. We want others to to see our life and to to go, man, I wish I had it like them. I mean, we post pictures of our meal online, and it looks like it came out of a gourmet kitchen. And the rest of us sitting over here going, man, I'm eating my ramen noodles that I just got out the microwave a minute ago. We're wondering what in the world's going on. Uh, Or, man, it doesn't stop there. And I think um, we do so many other things on social media. We paint a picture of the perfect family that we have. We paint this this picture with this perfect family picture where everybody's smiling and so happy. But what we don't see is on the backside of that picture is it took 30 minutes to get them to sit down for one picture. But the picture that's painted to you is that everything's perfect. And you're wondering, what in the world? How am I not a better parent? Like, what is going on right here? And, and so we paint that picture because we want others to see us in a certain light. You see, I don't think that it stops there, but I think it goes even deeper than those superficial things. I think it goes down to our heart. And then we don't want people to see our sin. We don't want people to see who we really are inside and the problem and the struggle that we have every day. 
And I think that in John, in this letter, that's one of the things that God is trying to tell us. And I think that the truth that we're going to take from the Scripture today, just kind of the overall theme of our passage today, is that to walk in the light, we have to get our sin out of the dark. To walk in the light, we have to get our sin out of the dark. See, so many of us, man, when we have some kind of struggle, when we have some sin, we want to hide it away in a dark place so that nobody sees it. We want to keep it away so that people look at us in a certain, in a certain way. We don't want people to not like us or to think that, think that we're different than them or to think that we're worse than them. We try to hide it away in the closet where nobody sees it. But I think we see from this series that God is calling us to get our sin out of the dark and into the light because that's the only way that we can walk in freedom with Him. And I think these three verses today, man, it paints a clear picture of how we do that in our everyday life. So if you will, look at 1 John 1, 8 through 10 with me. We'll read it together. It says this. It says, If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. See, I think that through this series and through this passage that we're reading today, that God is calling us as followers of his to walk in the light, to get out of the dark and start walking in the freedom that the light brings. And so if we look at our passage, the first truth that I think that we can pull from there to help us to walk in the light is to walk in the light, we can't deceive ourselves. To walk in the light, we can't deceive ourselves. See, so many of us, we, we look at our life and we go, man, I, don't, I got it going pretty good right now. I'm not struggling as much as, as that other person. And that's where we get in trouble. I don't think that anybody in the room, if I was to go around and ask you, I don't think anybody's walking around going, man, I'm so good, just me and Jesus, man. Me, we have done it perfectly since the very beginning. I have never messed up. Me and Jesus, we like this, man. We, we did so good. The rest of y'all are messing up. Y'all got to struggle, but me and Jesus are good. No, man, none of us would ever say that. We, we would never make that claim. But I think where we get in trouble is we start comparing our sin to other people and we start belittling our sin. See, we look at that guy at work and we go, man, that guy's messing up, man. He's stealing some money on the side over here from his business, from this business. And man, I've never done anything like that. That guy's messing up and he is he is struggling with sin. But I wouldn't do that. Or we look at that girl at school and we go, man, that girl, she is messing up with her boyfriend. Like, it's serious. I think we should go talk about it to everybody else and talk about her to everybody else. But my sin is not as bad as hers. You see, we start belittling our sin and we start acting like our sin isn't a huge deal. And the Bible says that we deceive ourselves. See, the Bible also says that our heart is deceptive above all things and no one can trust it, okay? You can't trust your heart and the motives of your heart. Do I have any American Idol fans in the house? Is there anybody in here? I had like three in 830. Okay, there's no American Idol. Are you kidding me right now? Like, all right, I guess I'm the only American Idol fan in the house. So let me tell you a little bit about my story with American Idol. Man, my family, we love American Idol. It is one of our favorite things to do is to, to sit down as a family and watch American Idol from the beginning all the way to the end. Everybody has the American Idol app where we can go and vote for our favorite person. Even Grayson at seven years old, man, he's got his iPod and he's got his American Idol app so he can vote all 10 times for the person that he wants to vote for. And so we watch from the very beginning. It's kind of a tradition that we have uh, just to spend time together as a family. So we enjoy that. I mean, if you've watched the show at all, uh, especially from the very beginning, you know that a lot of things have changed over all the seasons of American Idol. See, uh, the judges have changed, the, the channel that it comes on has changed, kind of the way they do things has changed a little bit. But I remember, man, at the beginning years of the show, the show made its money off of going around the country and auditioning talent from off the street. Anybody could come up and they could audition to be the next American Idol. I just said that like Ryan Seacrest in my brain right there. I just wanted to let y'all in. Just the, the next American Idol. No, but 
everybody, they, you could come up no matter who you are and you could audition to become the next American Idol. And if you won the show, then you went on to, to get a record label and you would become famous and rich and like people would know who you are and your, your songs would be on the radio and so many of them, that was their dream. And so, man, through the rounds of the show, people are eliminated all the way to the end until that one person comes out on the end as the American Idol. And so, man, so many people would go down, thousands of people would go down and audition. And there was this one guy uh, that was a part of American Idol back in the very beginning years of the show. And he's probably one of the most famous people to ever be on American Idol. And he didn't even make it out of his audition. But this guy, his name was William Hong. He was 20 years old, and he was a civil engineering student in California when he heard that American Idol was coming to his city. And so just like thousands of other people, William looked at himself in the mirror, and he said, I'm going to be the next American Idol. I'm going to go down, and I'm going to showcase my talent, and I'm going to let everybody know how good of a singer I am, and I'm going to win the whole thing. And so William, he goes down, he waits in line for who knows how long, I'm sure hours upon hours. He gets into uh, the, the waiting room right outside where the judges are, and Ryan Seacrest comes up. He's about 20 years younger at this point, but he comes up, and he, he's interviewing William, and William tells him, I can't wait to go in and light up the stage. And man, did he ever light up the stage. I don't know if it's the way me and you would think about lighting up the stage, but he definitely did it. And so... Uh, what I wanted to do today is I was going to just explain that to you and just kind of give you a picture of it as, as I talked about it. But after watching the video this week, I could not help myself. I have got to show you William Hong and his audition on American Idol. So take a second and look at this. We have found the Ryan. next key. What's your name? My name is Ryan. Oh, nice to meet you. Nice to see you, buddy. Let me tell you what I'm going to sing. I'm okay. singing Ricky Martin, She Bangs. She Bangs. So, yes. <laughs> it's a good song, so, but, um, so it's either I really do well by lighting up the stage. Right. Or I don't. The producers, cast, and crew would like to express their gratitude to engineering student William Hung for showing up and shaking his bonbon. Okay. William. Yes. Talk to me. Tell me your name. You blow me off like it's all the same. You lit it fuse and I'm taking away like a bomb. Yeah, baby. She bangs, she bangs. Oh, baby, but she moves, she moves. I go crazy cause she looks like a flop, but she stings like a bee. Like every girl in history. She bangs, she bangs. I'm Thank wasted you. by the way Thank she... You. You can't sing, you can't dance, so what do you want me to say? And you know, I have no professional training of singing. No, we <laughs> didn't believe it either. Well, that's the surprise of the century. <laughs> man, you gotta love Simon Cowell, man. He, he tells it how it is. But man, it's easy for us to laugh at William Hong. And believe me, it is hilarious. I have watched that video about five or six times this week, and I have not made it through it once without laughing. I showed it to a couple of the guys in office, and they laughed too. You just can't watch it enough. I mean, it's hilarious. But man, William Hong, he shares something in common with the rest of us. William deceived himself into thinking that he could sing when he really couldn't. But I think some of us, man, we deceive ourselves when it comes to our sin struggle. We act like we have it all together and that things are going well in our life and that we don't need anybody to help us. But you see, that's called pride. And that's where we get in trouble. Because when we think that we can do it on our own and we don't constantly have to have the help of Jesus in our life, that's where we get in trouble. That's where our enemy wants us. He wants us to think that we've got it all together and that we can do it on our own. You see, God is telling us, man, to walk in the light, we can't deceive ourselves. And so how do we go about our life and not deceive ourselves? Because like I said a second ago, our heart is deceptive above all things. We can't trust our own judgment. You see, we've got blind spots that we can't see. Have you ever ridden in a car that has a bad blind spot? You can't see certain places out the car. But if you have somebody that's riding along with you and they have a different viewpoint, they can see outside of the car and they can help you to know if traffic is coming from one way or another. 
And that's something that we've got to do as followers of Jesus, man. We've got to have people in our life with a Christ-like mindset that will point us back to the cross when we veer off of the path that we're supposed to be on. And so, man, today, what I would tell you, if you don't have that group of people around you, man, I would encourage you so much, get connected with a life group here at the exchange. Man, it's so important to walk alongside other people and to, help, to let them help you walk, and you help them walk in the light and to stay out of the dark. Man, our life groups here, what we do is, is we read the Bible together. We pray together. Man, we encourage each other, but we also keep each other accountable. Now, we need that in our life because we can deceive ourselves. And see, God is telling us through this passage today, don't do it alone. You'll deceive yourself. To walk in the light, you can't deceive yourself. You've got to get your sin out of the dark. And so maybe that's what you need to hear today is that you need to get connected with other people. And another thing that we can do is, man, we can pray. And don't hear me say that we can pray and go, well, I'll just pray and I won't get connected with community because I'll just pray. You need both of those things in your life. And I think so many of us, man, we don't, we don't go to God in the way that we should because of we're scared of what he'll show us. We're scared that he might show us the ugliness that's inside of our heart. And right now we're looking at ourselves going, hey, we're doing pretty good. I don't, I don't think I got any real bad struggles. And we're scared that if we pray this prayer that God will show us and he'll, he'll break us. I mean, that's a good thing for him to do. And I think that there's, there's a perfect example of how to pray in that way in the Bible. Look at how David prayed to God in Psalm 139. It says this in 23 and 24 of that chapter. It says, Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my concerns. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the everlasting way. See, God, I mean, David laid his heart out to God right there because his ultimate concern, his ultimate goal as a follower of God was to follow him and to walk in the light. He didn't want to hide his sin in the dark anymore, but he wanted to walk in the light, and he knew he had to have God's help to help him. So maybe today that's what you need to do. You need to go to God in prayer and ask him to help you to quit deceiving yourself. And the second thing that I think that we need to see in this scripture, John says it twice in three verses. So I think he's really wanting us to take this and to apply it to our life. He says in, in verse 8, if we say we have no sin. And then he says again in verse 10, he says, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. And so I think the second thing that we see from this passage and what we need to pull out to apply to our lives is to walk in the light, we have to walk in the truth. To walk in the light, we have to walk in the truth. You see, so many of us, man, we skip over this part of our life because, man, we're too busy or we've got so many other things on our plate that we don't take time to spend with God and His Word. Man, that's the way that He guides us and He leads us and He changes us by speaking to us through His Word. And if we don't take time to walk in the truth, man, we're going to deceive ourselves. And I don't know, a lot of you probably already know this, but I grew up in the country. I thought, uh, I thought Pastor Bryant, it was so funny last week that he talked about growing up in the city in a neighborhood and all the games that they played. He talked about the street lights coming on and he knowing that, hey, that's time to go home when the street lights came on. But we ain't had no street lights where I grew up. There was not a street light in sight. I'm talking about... There was nothing that you saw but stars. You might hear your mama calling from way off to tell you to come home. But that's the only way that we knew is if it got dark or she was calling us home. But I think there's a lot of similarities between the two things. Growing up in the city and growing up in the country, you probably still play a lot of the same games. And I think one of them was hide and seek. Like in a neighborhood, that looks like hiding behind somebody's fence or a bush in their yard. But in the country, man, what we did is we played in the woods. Like, we real deal, hide and seek in the woods, and it was unlimited. Like, you just could go wherever you wanted to go, and the other team would have to find you. But probably one of my favorite things growing up, and one of my fondest memories of growing up, was as a kid, when one of my friends would have a spend-the-night birthday party. 
And we loved it. It was so fun. Like we would, for two weeks, we would be on the phone with each other. You know, back when the phone was connected to the wall, we would talk to each other and we would plan out what we were going to bring for this party and how we were going to play this game and that. But man, we always, we always seemed to end up playing hide and seek in the woods at night. And so we always had a flashlight in our bag. But if you've ever been in the country and walked out into the woods at night, Man, it's dark up in the woods. Let me tell you, like, you can't see your hand in front of your face dark out there in the woods. And so that flashlight that we would all bring was super important. And so when we would play hide and seek, what we would do is we would have a group that were hiders and a group that were seekers. And so when the seekers were counting and letting us have a chance to go hide, then we would go out into the woods and we would use our flashlight to go out and find a good spot to hide. See, one of the things that we did once we got out there and the seekers came after us, one of the things that we did is we would see them coming with their lights. And so as they got close to us, what we would try to do is we would try to sneak off without turning on our light. And see, more times than not, what would happen as soon as we tried to sneak off, man, we would fall in a hole or we'd trip over a stump or a limb or worse, we would run into a spider web. Man, I'm talking about you giving away your position? Yes. Everybody in Rankin County going to know where this boy is if I run into a spider web at night because them spiders that you run into in the woods, they ain't little. They big, big spiders. And so, man, what would happen is when we didn't turn on our light to guide us, then we thought we were being clever. And we might go along for a little while, but eventually something was going to happen. We were going to trip or we were going to fall or something was going to hinder us in our path. You see, so many of us, man, we go through life like that. We don't use the light that God has given us to light our path. And look at how the Bible describes itself in one nineteen one hundred five, Psalm 119, 105. It says, your word is a lamp for my feet and a light for my path. I know many of us have heard that before, but so many of us, we're going through life and we're not using the flashlight that God's given us. We're using the excuse of I'm too busy or I've got all these things going on or I don't get up early in the morning or, or whatever your excuse may be. But the truth is that that light that guides you is a priority for you. It should be in your life. And so you need to pull it out so it can guide your path and that you don't fall off of the path that God has for you to walk in the light. So how do you do that in your everyday life? How do you walk in the light? by walking in the truth. And I think the first thing that you have to do is you have to make it a priority, like I just said. You have to set aside time to spend in God's Word and to let Him speak to you. Because like I said earlier, and that's the way that He changes us. He speaks to us the truth that we're not believing in in our mind. Romans 12, 1 and 2, man, it says that God transforms our thoughts by the renewing of our mind in Scripture. And so if we're not taking the time to do that and all we're hearing is the outside world that's speaking to us, that's what's renewing our mind. That's what's transforming our mind if we don't take time to be rooted in God's Word. And so, man, we've got to take time to do that. And the second thing I would say, and I think this has helped me so much, man, is is Scripture memory. I know I don't want you to take that and go, oh, this is one more thing i got to do, but I want you to look at it Uh, from a different perspective, scripture memory, man, is so important because you can take God's word with you into every situation that you go into in life. You see, Pastor Tyler, he talked about in week one how many times we don't have time to go back to God's word and to look up how to handle a certain situation when you're angry at somebody at work or when your kid acts up. You don't have time to go back and to see how God would want you to act. But when you internalize his word, when you take it with you, you, it's already there and it's begun to transform you and you're more likely to act in the way that God would want you to act. Then the third thing that I think that you should do when spending time in the truth is that you should spend time in the truth with other people. There's been so many times that as I've been in my men's group or if I've been at home studying my Bible with my wife, man, there's been so many times that one of those guys or my wife will see something that I don't see. They'll see it from a different perspective that I don't see it. And many times, man, that's exactly what God uses to speak to me 
and to change the way I'm thinking about a certain situation. And so, man, what God is trying to tell us today to walk in the light, and you've got to pick up his truth. You've got to use his truth as a lamp for your path. You can't keep going through life and expecting to make it on your own decisions and your own knowledge, but you've got to spend time intentionally letting him guide you. And so today, to walk in the light, we've got to walk in the truth. The next thing that I think that, that John wants us to see in this letter is he uses the words, if we confess our sins. And there's a promise that goes on the back side of that, but I want us to look at just those few words right there, if we confess our sins. And I want us to talk about that for a minute, because I think it's something that we really need to deal with today. We need to grasp. Because so many of us, man, we don't want to confess our sins. And I'm with you. I understand. Like, that's not something that we look forward to doing, owning our faults. Maybe it's because you're scared of what somebody will think of you if you confess something that you've done. Maybe it's because you're still enjoying what you're doing and you're not ready to quit. Or maybe it's because you don't want somebody in your private life knowing the things that are going on inside of you, including God. See, God's telling us in this passage that we have to get that sin out of the dark and into the light and able to, to, we're able to walk in freedom. Think about a couple of examples from the Bible. And think about Adam and Eve all the way back in Genesis 3. As soon as they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and as soon as they took that bite of that apple, what did they do? They ran and they hid behind a bush. And man, it's, it's easy to, for us to look at them and go, what in the world are you thinking? Like, why are you going and hiding behind a bush? You literally walk with God every day in the garden. You know he created all of this. You've seen his power. You know who he is. And yet you go hide behind a bush? What is wrong with you? Have you lost it? But so many of us do that all the time. We sin and we act like it's not a big deal and we kind of push it to the side and hope nobody sees it. But God's telling us we can't do that. We've got to confess our sin. We've got to own up to it. What about King David? I mean, David was one of Israel's greatest kings, and he walked with God closely for most of his life. But there was a point in time in David's reign as king where, man, he had some unconfessed sin that he had to deal with. And the Bible tells us that David, he was supposed to be at war with the rest of the men of the nation. But instead, he decided to stay back. And so one night, the Bible tells us that he walked up on the roof of his palace and he began to survey his kingdom. And he looked down and he saw Bathsheba bathing. And Bathsheba was a married woman to one of David's soldiers, Uriah. But David, even knowing that, he called for Bathsheba to come to his palace. And Bathsheba ended up pregnant. And so David, knowing that his sin was going to eventually find him out, he, he scurried for a way to try to cover it up and to try to make sure that nobody knew about it. And so what he did is he, he sent for Uriah and he told him to come home. And, and David tells Uriah, hey man, I want you to go home and I just want you to chill and relax with your wife, take a week vacation from the war because you've been working so hard. And Uriah leaves from David and he decides, I'm not going to do that. That's not the right thing to do when, when my fellow soldiers are out laying on the ground in battle. It would not be right for me to go home and to relax with my wife. So Uriah sleeps on the steps of the palace that night. And when David realized that Uriah wasn't going to go home, his plan was not going to work. He couldn't pin the coming pregnancy on Uriah. So he knew that even though he had called him home, there was no way for him to cover it up that way. So he had to think of something else. And so David began to pen a letter to the general of the army. And he wrote to the general and he said, what I want you to do is as soon as the battle gets to the fiercest part of it, I want Uriah to be on the front lines of the battle. And as soon as it gets really bad, I want you to pull back from him so that he'll be killed. And then he sealed it with his king's seal and he sent it by the hand of Uriah to the general of the army. And so Uriah literally delivered his death sentence. And that's exactly what happened during the battle. They pulled back from him and Uriah was killed. And you see, it looks like to us at that point, man, David, he had done what he'd set out to do. He had covered up his sin and nobody knew about it. 
But see, the truth is, maybe not a lot of people knew about it, but David knew about it, Bathsheba knew about it, and God knew about it. And look at what David says about his unconfessed sin in uh, Psalms 32, 3 and 4. This is what he says about his unconfessed sin. It says, For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. See, David acknowledges right there that we can't hide our sin forever. We can't push it into the closet and hide it into the dark and expect for it to never surface, for it to never give us a burden of shame to bear. He, said, he literally said that his bones were wasting away because of the shame and the guilt that was on him. You see, David eventually confessed his sin to God because of a friend that came to him and called him out for what he had done. Look at what David says in verse 5 after he acknowledges his sin. It says, I acknowledge my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. You see, David, he took his sin to God. And then and only then was he able to escape the guilt and the shame and the burden that he was having to carry. And so today, maybe that's what you need to hear. Maybe there's some sin that you're hiding away in the dark and it's affecting you. You feel like your bones are wasting away, like David says. Man, I would encourage you to bring that to God today. How do we do that? How do we walk in the light by confessing our sin? And I think the first thing that we have to do is we have to first and foremost bring that sin to God. Because he paid for it. He's the one that you first and foremost have sinned against. And we have to bring it and lay it at his feet because he's the only one that can cleanse us of it. And the second thing I need, think you need to do is that if you sinned against somebody, then you need to go to that person and you need to ask for their forgiveness. And I'm not going to sit up here and tell you that every time you go and ask for forgiveness from somebody, that you're going to receive it. That's not what God is calling us to do. He's calling us to take our sin out of the dark and put it into the light so that we can receive healing. And the third thing that I think you need to do is I think you need somebody in your life that you can go to and that you can confess your sin to. You need a person in your life that you can confess your struggles to and they can confess their struggles to you. And you know that in that person that you have a partner to walk through life with that can help you to stay on the right path and to confess your sin and to be healed. Look at what James says about confessing your sin to each other. It says, Therefore confess your sin to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. How do you walk in the light by confessing your sin? And you've got to get it out of the dark, and you've got to take that difficult step to put it at God's feet. You've got to take that difficult step to ask for forgiveness and confess of what you've done. And then you've got to continue walking in that way throughout your life. Because to walk in the light, we have to confess our sin. And that brings me to the last truth that I want us to pull out today. And that truth comes on the back end of that phrase, if we confess our sins. It says, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so the truth that I want us to pull out from that today is that when we walk in the light, Jesus cleanses us from the dark. When we walk in the light, Jesus cleanses us from the dark. And that's the best news that any of us could ever ask for today. I mean, what more could you ever ask for that the burden that you carry, you don't have to carry it. All you have to do is lay it at his feet because he's paid for it. He sent Jesus to die on a cross to take away the burden of your sin. And all you have to do is to do what he tells you and lay it at his feet and walk in that freedom. And I got such a beautiful picture of this the other day. 
Now, that, the other day I went out on an afternoon. It was a hot afternoon, and I went out to mow my yard. And I know it's probably safest to wear jeans and safety glasses and all that kind of stuff. But man, it's hot, and I'm trying not to pass out. So I went out with some shorts on. And when I got done mowing my yard and weed eating and, and blowing everything off, I came up to the door, and I looked down at my legs, and my legs were covered in dirt and just filth and grass, and they were nasty. And I knew if I stepped foot inside my house and sat on a couch like that, my wife would kill me because we got white couches. And so <laughs> I, I decided real quickly that I needed to take off my shoes and gingerly walk to the bathroom to wash off my legs. And so I threw my legs over into the bathtub, and I took the water that was coming out of the faucet, and I began to scrub and wash my legs. And as the grass and the dirt and the filth and just the gunk fell off of my legs, it fell into the water, and it ran to the drain, and it went down the drain. And in that moment, it was like God gave me such a clear picture. And he said, that's what I do with your sin. I wash it away. It goes into the water and it's drained away, never to be seen again. All you have to do is bring it to me. So maybe that's what you need to hear today. Maybe you've been carrying that. You've been trying to work and you've been trying to do more so that you'll look better. But Jesus is telling you today, lay it at my feet. I'm the only one that can cleanse you because of the the price that I paid. And so what would it look like for you today to bring your sin and confess it to God? And I think it would take a burden off of your shoulders that you were never meant to bear. I think you could walk in freedom and in the light like God intended you to do. What if you stop deceiving yourself and acting like you got it all together? It's just like John said, if we do that, we call God a liar because he's pretty clear in his word that we have a struggle with sin. And so what can we do to walk in the light? I think one of the things that we can do is, like I said, walk in the truth because his truth reminds us of where we are. And so what would it look like for you today to do those things? Because God is clearly calling us from this passage today to get our sin out of the dark. He says to us to walk in the light, get your sin out of the dark. So my question to you today is what are you going to do? Are you going to get your sin out of the dark? Or are you going to continue to hide it there and let your bones waste away, like David said? What are you going to do? Are you going to walk in the light? Or are you going to continue to walk in the dark?